Thank you, Jesus. Appreciate God. Let's go right into prayer. Father, we thank you for this wonderful service this night. We thank you, God, for all of your goodness and your mercy. Lord, above everything else, we thank you for your spirit, because it's not by might, not by power, but by your spirit that you take care of all the things that we have need of. Lord, I'm thankful and I'm grateful for you sending, Lord, your word, just using me, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for your power that breaks every yoke and every chain and causes people's lives to be changed forever. Oh, Holy One, we ask you in Jesus' name that you will direct this service. Lord, even as you already have, Lord, as your anointing has been here, Lord, don't let up now. God, we ask you to use this word, plant it in the hearts, Lord, and don't let it be carried away by the cares of this life and the the deceitfulness of riches. Don't let it be sown, Lord Jesus, among thorns and stones. But God, let it be in the good ground of the hearts. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, amen. Amen. Well, my mom has wanted me to tell you all a little bit about the service yesterday. And so I'm just going to tell you, y'all missed it. Y'all really missed it. And everybody else did too. Nobody came. But see, here's the thing. God sent me some scriptures that are not part of this, not part of this word that I'm going to teach you tonight that relates to both yesterday and today. And I'm just going to read them. Here's the thing. Jesus said, and he was telling about the, the rich man that had a wedding for his son. He says, Then he says to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. You see, God has sent the people here that are worthy to receive the feast. You're here because you're worthy to get the feast that God has for you of his word. And those who didn't come, they weren't worthy. So be it. You know, even in the New Testament, I mean, even in the writings of the Acts of the Apostles, one of them stood up boldly and said, considering that you've considered yourself unworthy of eternal life, we'll go to the Gentiles instead. You see, God is not mocked. What a man sows, that he's going to reap. And so those who are not here, okay, that's fine. But you're here because God selected you because you're worthy to come to this feast. You're worthy to hear the word of God and to go out and to to make 100-fold. You make 100-fold fruit. We're going to start in Hosea 4.6. Now, those of you who know the way I preach, I am a preacher of lot of the Bible. When I preach, I preach the word all over the place because the word of God kind of just speaks for itself. But sometimes you have to combine it together and say, there's a scripture over here, a scripture over here. They work together with each other. They make a better understanding of the whole word. If you read it all together from beginning to end, you begin to really understand that this is one book. There may be 66 of them in here, but there's really one book, one word, one word. And so when I read, if you can't follow along fast enough, feel free to pick up these cards. I'll have them sitting over here on this little rostrum. And you can go back after service and find out what I read from if you can't catch up. All right, Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you shall be no priest to me. Seeing you've forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Now, this is not the main, the main subject of my sermon, but this is to let you know what I'm going to be doing for you tonight. God has given me knowledge for your sakes, for your edification, so that you won't be destroyed. For those of you who are here, God has this word for you. And so this knowledge that God has given is so that you won't be destroyed. Those who don't receive the knowledge, who don't want the knowledge because you've rejected knowledge, God says, I'm rejecting you. So it is. But going on, the main focus of this sermon tonight is to let you know 
as you probably have forgotten, I don't believe God would have given me this sermon if it hadn't been for the fact that you have forgotten who you are. You don't know who you are, and I'm going to tell you who you are. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that, let me make sure I'm in the right spot. Yep. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying godliness, ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, I don't know what y'all have felt throughout your lives, but I know when I was growing up as a child, I always wondered why kids didn't like me. I had no understanding of what the problem was. I just knew that they didn't like me. I tried everything I could learn to try and be acceptable. I tried everything I could do to, to fit in with the way that they wanted to play sports. I actually followed the rules and did what they said for me to do, and then they still didn't like me because I wasn't like them. Yeah. I still couldn't be like them no matter how much I tried. God has made us a peculiar, an unusual, an alien people to this world. You know, Jesus, he said, I'm not from this world. Even as you're not of this world, I'm not of this world. You know, we are not here because flesh and blood conceived us. The Bible says that we were born not of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. And so as children, as sons of God, as people that God placed on this earth for his peculiar and for his unusual purpose, we have to recognize that we're never going to be like everybody else. And if we know that, then we can start to go out and say, well, hey, you know, I don't care. If I'm not like somebody else, okay, whatever. Don't, don't bother me. No skin off my nose, as they say. You know, I can't be the kind of person that builds $100 million churches. I can't be the kind of person that tries to bring the youth in through rock, Christian rock groups. I can't be the kind of person that even hears a lie and doesn't say something about it. Because that's not who God made me. And you're the same way. God has made you a peculiar, a weird, if you want to call it that, people. You weirdos. I'm one too. <laughs> so don't think you're going to fit in. Don't think people are even going to be able to understand you when you speak. Because you don't speak of earthly things. You speak of heavenly things. When Jesus came to Nicodemus, he says, if I've told you these little earthly things, how can you possibly understand if I speak to you of heavenly things? They can't understand your speech. Jesus himself came along and said, why don't you understand my speech, even because you're not of my sheep, as I said to you from the beginning? You see, you are sent as a strange and an unusual thing in this world. Think about how unusual and how strange it is to the night that's outside these walls, that we have lights and light bulbs. This is not a normal thing. This is something that man has invented to give light at night. These are weird things. So we are the same thing. We are strange and unusual and peculiar people. First Peter 2.9 says something very similar. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people. Now, we know for sure now that he's talking not about the Jews, but about the Gentiles, about us. You see, if he was just talking about how he chose out of all the nations of the earth, to set his name in Israel, as he did in the Old Testament, if he was still talking about those people, 
then he wouldn't be talking about the people that were called not a people that are now a people. We are the ones who were not a people, and now we are a people of God, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Now consider that the Bible already said that we are grafted in Jews. Okay, So when it's talking about the Gentiles here, it's talking about the sinners. Have your conversation honest among the Gentiles, among the sinners. Now, I don't think I need to preach on this. I don't think I need to go into a whole sermon about how you're supposed to be truthful. But if you've got a problem with saying what's right, read the scriptures. It says you've got to be honest before the world. Out there, they don't see honesty. They don't see truthfulness. Because they don't know who the truth is. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. So you're the only example they may ever have of what truth really looks like. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So even if it is that they talk evil of you while they see you right now, consider and know that their heart may turn back to God when the time of visitation comes, if, even while you're being evil spoken of, you still have good works. As you're doing righteously, they will still come back. They'll still hear and receive the gospel if you will do what the Bible says. But you are a peculiar people, a stranger, a stranger. Think about how that Abraham walked around in the wilderness how he was a nomad. He had no place to put his feet. He had no place to say, this is my home. I'm settling down here. This is the place I'm going to stay for the rest of my life. We're the same thing. We are aliens, strangers, and, and pilgrims in this land. When you go out into the world, you know, you feel that inside. I'm not like they are. They're not like I am. You know, they think strangely. Well, you think strangely to them too. You know, you're not their thoughts and they're not your thoughts. So the same way God says with us, he says, my thoughts are a whole lot higher than your thoughts as the heavens are higher than the earth. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Well, you have to know that your thoughts as children of God, as sons and daughters of God are way higher as the heavens are higher than the earth than those fleshly earthly thoughts that they have. So you have to point them to the gospel. Hebrews 11.13 says, these all, talking about, you know, the, the scripture in Hebrews, 11th chapter is the faith chapter, tells you about all the many people that have done great, wonderful works, having faith in God and not even seeing the end of all of those things. It says, these, having died in the faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them far off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Embrace it. You know, in this generation, we have something that we haven't had in all the many generations that have come before. In this generation, we've got people that say, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl. And they embrace that wickedness. And they openly proclaim their evil. And yet it seems that you can't find Christians that are willing to do that. He says right here, embrace the fact that you're a stranger and a pilgrim. Confess it that you're not part of this world. I can't be like you because I'm not like you. I was not born like you were. I was born into the spirit of God. I was born into the kingdom of God. So don't let them <laughs> drag you down to their level and say, yeah, you just need to be like everything else that we do. Why, why do you have a problem? You know, you know, why do you speak up against homosexuality? Don't do that. That's, that's not nice. Well, it may not be nice, but it's right. Yeah. I don't care if it's nice. Sometimes people need a spanking, Amen. you know, you don't go around telling a kid, oh, honey, don't do that again because I really don't like that to be done. When they've already done it 15, 20 times and they know 
that you asked them not to and they did it anyway, they're stubborn and rebellious, you, <laughs> you start pulling off your belt. Yeah. <laughs> so it may not be nice. Even the Bible says no chastening for the present is enjoyable, but afterwards it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness. So if you've got to come at them with a sword in your hand and say, hey, this is what the Bible says, you don't do that. You want to do that? You go somewhere else besides my house. This is my house. You stay here. You're going to follow the word of God. Amen. <laughs> John 1 11, one of my favorite scriptures. Now, this is something that people don't quite catch exactly how deep and how simple this is sometimes. John 1 11 says, He came to his own, and his own received him not. He came to the people that he called his own name, to the Jews. They didn't receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, Brother Chris loves to do this, and I'll do it a little bit. Somebody read that, that verse 12 again. But as, as, as some might have received him, as, as a few, as many. Is that what it really says? Keep reading. Even to some of them that believe on his name. Yeah. <laughs> You know, think about it. People don't realize just how important that is. When you look out in the world, Jesus said, am I even going to find faith on the earth? Right? There are very few people. They say they do, but by works they deny him. There are very few people that actually really, really believe Jesus. They'll say, yeah, I'm a Christian. They'll call themselves by the name of God. They'll say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm Christ-like. Look at me. I go to church. I do my thing. Look at all my good works. I, I feed the poor. But wait, are you Christ-like? Are you truly? Jesus said, if you believe me, you'll do my commandments. If you love me, do what I told you to do, yeah. right? So those people, those people that believe him enough to do what he says, those are the ones that he says, I've given you power to become sons of God. Now, People, I'm telling you, something about it, y'all ain't catching about this or else God wouldn't have me out here preaching it to you. You're not catching what that means. To be as Jesus was walking on this earth, to have the power of almighty God living right inside your own physical, fleshly, earthly body. To be as Jesus is. He says, I go to my father. And if you knew who he was, you'd be, you'd be saying, good, good, go on. <laughs> Get on out of here. If you knew, because after I am come back in the Holy Ghost, you'll do the works that I've done. But greater works than these have you, shall you do. Now, let me ask you, straightforward. How many of you can raise your hands and say, I've done the works of Jesus? Some of them. Okay, raise your hand if you've healed a sick person. <laughs> well, you see, they said Jesus healed him, right? But he says, guess what? I do nothing. I didn't do nothing. Let's read that. Y'all don't see this, but you're going to see it. <laughs> John 5, 17. He didn't just say this once. But Jesus answered them, My father works until now, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because not only had he, made, had he broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For what things soever he does, these also does the son likewise." Are you a son of God? You should be doing like your father. Your father heals the sick. Are you? 
Your father raises the dead. Are you? You have an example of Jesus Christ walking on the water. Do you? Are you a son? Can you prove it to me? Can you prove it? <laughs> you know, one part of the Bible says, you show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You want me to prove that I'm a son of God? Show me a sick person. You know, it's just that simple. We have lost the simplicity of having God as our father. We've lost the understanding of what it means to be almighty. To be almighty as God is because he's our father. Not because we are anything. Not because Jesus was anything. He says, I do nothing. Did I not read that part? Let's read that part. Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. Jesus healed the sick. Am I wrong? Jesus healed the sick. And then he goes along and says, I didn't do it. My father did it. There's going to be people out there who are going to look at you and say, if you're a son, if you're really a son of God, they're going to say, I got somebody I need you to heal. I got somebody I need you to raise from the dead. And you're going to say, well, I can't do it. But my father already showed me that I'm going to go over there and I'm going to pray for them. And they're going to be healed. You see, show yourself to be the person that God made you. Let me tell you an example of something on the opposite scale, on the devil's side. And let me show you how courageous you need to be. There is a man named Kamal Saleem. You can look his testimony up on YouTube. He was told throughout his childhood that he was going to be a great man for Allah. He was told that he was going to do great things in the kingdom of Allah. And that he was going to go out there and he was going to conquer. He was going to be a great man. God was going to use him. And so he believed that growing up. He absolutely knew that as far as he could see in his pathway, he was going to go out and he was going to conquer the world for Islam. And he would, he would listen to these things that his parents would tell him. And he believed, just like any child should believe their parents, he believed with his full heart, yes, I'm going to do great things. I'm going to be a great man. And so when he got to a point where he was old enough to begin to work in the things that he had been taught, guess what he wanted to do? He said in his mind, he says, if I am God's messenger, if I am sent by God and anointed by God to go out and conquer the world for Islam, let me find the worst place that I can find with the worst infidels there are to go out and conquer. So where did he go? He went to the Bible Belt because we were the infidels. The Christians were the infidels. So the very thing that he went out to do was to try and bring the Christians to belief in Allah. And God, I'll let you listen to his testimony on your own. God knocked him off his high horse. He was driving to a place to convert a man that had already agreed that he was going to meet him. And God let him have a car accident. He got knocked clear out of his car on the side of the road through a long series of things. Um, God showed himself. He said, why don't you pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because he had prayed to the God of Allah. He had prayed to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. And there was no, no voice that came, no answer. And God spoke to him and says, why don't you pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You know, in the Bible it says, this is my name forever. And he prayed. He said, Father God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if you are there, I want to know who you are. And Jesus Christ walked into his room and showed himself. You see, all the power that that man had in the powers of darkness was nothing, nothing for God. You see, if we are sons of God, if we are an anointed generation, if we are a royal priesthood, if we're there for the very purpose as God's own sons and daughters, then why are we so cowardly as to sit around and say, well, God, you didn't send me anywhere this time. 
<laughs> Wait a minute. He said, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Oops. I guess you need to go into the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, don't you? <laughs> Why are we so cowardly? We don't know who we are. John 5, 30, in the same chapter, it says, I can, Jesus' his own words, right in here in red, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I don't seek my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. John 8, 28. Then said Jesus to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. Now, if you ever needed multiple testimonies from Jesus, you know, the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, the thing is confirmed. So if Jesus said it three times, I guess it's probably going to be true. You know, sometimes he starts out and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, <laughs> because he really wants you to understand, yeah, this is, I really mean the truth here. But sometimes he has it in multiple places as testimony that says, I can do nothing. But my, as my father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. My father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Raise your hand if you do always those things that please God. Oops. <laughs> if you're going to be a son, you need to start acting like the son. You start acting like Jesus did. He says, I can't do anything on my own, but everything that my father tells me to do, I do it. And he's happy with me because I'm doing it. Not because I'm sitting down and saying, God, what you going to tell me today? I need, some, I need some instruction today. I need you to tell me what to do today. Come on. You see, Jesus said, my father talks to me and he tells me what I need to do. And then I go out and do it. It's as simple as that. Now listen to what he changes it around in John 15. This is where it gets good, folks. John 15, 4. Well, I'll read from first verse. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. Now, he first tells you three times, I can't do anything unless my father tells me to do it, right? Then he says, you can't do anything unless you're in me. Look how simple he's made it to go from being, I can't do anything till I can do everything. Amen. Look how easy he made it to go from being fleshly, earthly, normal, common, ordinary, everyday person to being a son of God. It's as easy as that. You abide in him. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. I could stop the sermon right there. That's as, that's as far as it goes, honestly. When you do what God tells you to do, he said, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. That's who they are. And the reason why I'm giving you this instruction tonight to remind you of who you are is because you forgot just, first of all, how easy it was to be a son of God, but also to forget the power of God that dwells inside of you. Can any of you, can any of you say, that if Jesus was walking the earth right now, and you'd heard of all those miracles and, and all those things that he's done, walking on the water, healing the sick, raising the dead, could any of you say, I don't want that, I don't need that, that's not, a, that's not important to me? Wouldn't you be clamoring to go and find him? Wouldn't you be driving hundreds of miles if you had to? 
What has this man got? What is he doing? What's he saying? This is some cool stuff. But listen, you're that person. You're that person. That's who God made you. You're that person that heals the sick and raises the dead, casts out devils in his name. You're the person that God has sent to this earth as a stranger and a pilgrim, as his own son, as his own daughter, to go out and to change this world. You see, the very course of history is altered by what you do. When people look back as your sons and daughters and grandchildren, and they say, man, I knew a man 10 years ago. Whoo, that man had the power of God in him. Or they could say, oh, my grandpa, he was such a sweet person. I'm sorry he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got the choice to make to say, am I going to be something that God made me to be, or am I going to just be an ordinary, old, poor dump person? Am I going to be a simple old, you know, sitting around twiddling my thumbs type of person? Or am I going to get out there and I'm going to do what God said? And I read this already, but I have a tendency to read ahead of myself as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That's in Romans 8. Now listen to this. This is John. We'll, we'll stay in John. John's a good book. John 11, verse 25. Let's read 24, just so we know where we are. Martha says to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Eh. Lazarus is dead. I know there's going to be a big resurrection. Everybody's going to be there. I got it. I'm still sorry my, my brother's dead, but I understand he'll be alive one day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Yeah. Listen, folks. Does Jesus live in you or doesn't he? If he does, then the resurrection and the life lives in you. And that's why it's so easy to raise a dead person. So counterintuitive, your brain don't think it works that way. But Jesus lives in you, and therefore, go raise the dead. It's his commandment. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Go do it. And we know this scripture. I don't have to, I don't even have to tell you where it is. Everybody knows greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But you see, you don't really recognize what that means until you recognize that you are the one that God sent. Greater is he that lives right inside of you than he that is in the world. Greater is he than death itself. Greater is he than any disease. And it's not just that he is out there working works with great men of God that are walking around and, you know, going places, placing on airplanes. That's not what it's about. What it's about is that you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, you, why owe you? Greater is he that is in you that is than he that is in the world. Luke chapter 10 now, this is what happens when people finally start to realize what God has done for them. <clears throat> Luke ten seventeen. God had sent out 70 people, and they returned, the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through your name. Can you believe it? Look at what happened. I cast out a devil. Me. <laughs> that's what it is when you finally realize I brought a person back from the dead <sighs> me I did it because Jesus is in me you see <laughs> God has already given you 
the power to become a son of God just by believing on his name. If you've believed on his name, that doesn't just mean, yeah, I believe he's a great guy that existed. It means I believe the word he spoke and he spoke and said that I could raise the dead. He spoke and said that I could heal the sick. He spoke and said that I could cast out demons in his name. His word doesn't change. So if it's written in these 66 books, it's ironclad. Now, don't get confused when you read somebody else's testimony and they say something about God, and then it doesn't turn out to be the truth. I've heard many preachers read through the book of Job and start quoting the words of the friends that God eventually said, these people haven't spoken what's right of me. So read it with the understanding and know who's speaking. But when it's spoken under the inspiration of God, you can't turn it back. God's word will not come back to him void. <laughs> Amazing stuff. And he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give to you. Y'all say me. me. Jesus gave to me power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Now, I know I've been in some situations myself where I look at whatever it is that the devil's thrown at me and I go, oh, this is just too much for me. I just can't handle this. Right? You ever done that? This is just way too much. God, you got to do something. I can't handle this. This is way too much for me. But what does it say? It says over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Again, if you've forgotten it, now's the time to renew it in your remembrance that there is nothing that's formed against you, no weapon that's formed against you that can prosper. But more than that, he gives you power over the power of the enemy. You know the reason why most people, most people are sick is because they never resist the devil. They never fight back. They just say, oh, I'll take a pain pill or oh, I'll get you know, some extra vitamin C. Or, I'll do this, I'll do that. But really, that's not how it works. It's a spiritual battle. It always has been. And what you have to do is say, uh-uh, no, get away from me, devil. It doesn't require you doing a, a hard work. Oh, God, take this demon away from me. It's tearing me apart. You don't have to do that. You really don't have to. When you are a son of God and you recognize that God himself lives inside of you. He's not way up there in the heavens. That's what the Bible says. He says, God is, Jesus is not up in the heavens that you have to call him down. Hey, hey, you come here. He's not down in the belly of the earth. Do you have to dig down there and find him? The word of faith, which is the word that we preach, is in your mouth and in your heart. So all you have to do is speak as God speaks. You see, God speaks a thing as though it is when it ain't yet. He knows that by the act of him speaking it, it happens. We need to recognize that by our act of saying it, by our act of speaking the word of God, that is what changes the circumstances. You speak and you resist the devil and he will. Did it say, did it say shall? Did it say maybe? Did it say possibly? Maybe sometimes. <laughs> He will flee. Oh, this is some good stuff. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. See, even if all this world, you went through it and you had no happiness whatsoever. Now, God's not going to do that. I'm going to tell you ahead of schedule. God gave you a a happiness right here. He says, my peace and my joy I leave with you, not as the world gives, give I to you. In other words, I'm not going to take it back. I gave it to you. It's yours. Have it. Use it. But even if you went through this whole world and had no good come to you, 
and you believed in Jesus, and you just barely managed to make it into the heavens by the skin of your teeth. Now, personally, I try to brush my teeth enough that I don't have skin on my teeth. Sometimes it don't work out too well. But if you just barely got into heaven by the skin of your teeth, rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Be happy just knowing that you're going to get there. I'm going to read one more set of scriptures, and then I'm going to close. This is Numbers 13, 27. Thank you, Jesus. Numbers 13, 27. And they told him and said, We came to the land where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. We are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they would be stronger than we. Now how many times, how many times... Christians, have we done this? No, that's just a little bit too much. I can't do that, God. No, no, no. They got giants over there. I, I can't. Mm -mm. I mean, what if God told you to go into one of those mega churches and preach against Joel Osteen? Would you be saying, oh, oh, no, <laughs> not me. Somebody else, not me. That's what Moses did. He said, send somebody else. I don't want it. Leave me alone. <laughs> but Caleb stilled the people and he says, let's go up because we're well able to possess it. Right? He knew that God had already said to Moses that they were going to. See, that's what we have to do is we have to look at this Bible and it says, you shall, you shall heal the sick, you shall raise the dead, etc. Whatever it is, you shall and say, it's already written. Why should I be scared of these things? Numbers 14, 19. Well, let's go on a little bit further. Um, I don't have the exact numbers on my thing, but I'll just read the important part. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. That's what he's saying right now about the people that didn't make it. Okay? You didn't come, you're not going to get in. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and has followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land whereto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Not only to you, but also to your children, is this promise given. That as long as you follow God fully, and you have another spirit with you. When somebody says, oh, that's way too much. No, 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 no. You know, I've, I remember when Brother Terrell was starting to go on a fast and his pastor said, Oh no, no, that's the, no, God didn't speak to you. That's not right. You know, he told about that he was put off from that fasting that he needed to do because of the fact that his pastor said, no, this is not of God. This is not right. This is too much for you. You'll die. You'll kill yourself, little David. And he wasn't able to perform those things that he needed to do for many years because he listened to the voice of, oh, no, 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 this is a little bit too much. Dial it back a little bit. Let's, let's start small. No, 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 folks. No, no, no. Do like Caleb did. He says, we are well able to possess it. We are well able. You see somebody on the street that's got no legs, 
Don't get yourself, ooh, oh God, that's, ooh. Help him, Jesus. <laughs> Go say, we are well able to possess it. Go pray for him and let God give him some legs. You know, you see somebody out there with AIDS, they're all shriveled up and dying. You say, God's going to take a miracle to do that. Okay, let's go do a miracle. Amen? You know, it's not you anyway. It wasn't Jesus anyway. But when God puts that in your heart, don't get fear that says, no, that's a little too much. You, you can't do that. You're just, a, you're just a person. You're just a human being. You know, the devil will try to remind you of all that stuff that you've already got under the blood. Oh, you sinned yesterday. Mm, can't go heal them. God's not going to listen to sinners. He'll use every trick in the book. But that's not where you are put. God put you in this service. God put you here to remind you of the fact you are a son of the living God and all that entails. And that you don't have to be fearful like everybody else. All right, Pastor Spivey.